and welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. Joining me today is Scott Smith. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great Mark, to have you. It's, thank you for having me. So Scott, you've recently written a book entitled The Emerging Kingdom. And in that book, you outline a revolutionary idea that if adopted, would fundamentally transform the living standard for the United States and the rest of the world. Tell us about that idea. We often say it's money that holds us back. And on an individual basis, that's going to be true. And depending on how you live your life, you'll have more or less money. But you're always financially constrained. So if you were to talk to somebody like Elon Musk, you know, what would he do with a few billion dollars more? It would advance his space program, or there are plenty of things. You know, so even with your billionaires, money constrains them. But when you advance to the level of a society or a nation that has a central bank, then the idea that money constrains the activities of a nation becomes a bit ludicrous. And in fact, there is not an infinite amount of things that we can do. You know, we are constrained by the laws of physics, by our knowledge of biochemistry, our knowledge of science and our technology. Those are the real constraints. Beyond that, we're probably constrained by our imaginations in the way we develop perspectives. But money is a different issue when you come to the level of a nation that actually creates its own money, which we do. That's the role of the Federal Reserve. And so I wanted to look at it differently, saying, knowing that how you engineer society and banking and taxation so that your only constraints are your own knowledge and your own ability, natural resources. So the idea that you put forth in your book is known as the Financial Freedom Act. And whenever somebody come, puts out a piece of legislation or proposes a piece of legislation, people's eyes tend to glaze over in the back of their heads and you know, they tend to sort of tune out of the conversation. But this Financial Freedom Act really has the potential to do something really significant. What is the Financial Freedom Act and how does it work? So the Financial Freedom Act the word freedom would apply to the individual citizens, how it impacts an individual's financial freedom. It also applies to the nation as a whole. How does it impact the nation's financial freedom? And so the Financial Freedom Act necessarily has a number of components to it. There's not just one little switch you flip and everything's better. But there are surprisingly few switches that you need to flip to make things substantially better. And so it addresses the tax code first and foremost. The radical change to the tax code that would dramatically reduce personal taxes, and yet you could generate three times the revenue of what we do today. So obviously that bears explaining. <laughs> With that additional revenue, you're able to do things like balance the budget, pay off the debt, provide basic income, and even provide free higher education, all while balancing the budget, paying off the debt, and reducing taxes. So that's the main gist, the uh, Financial Freedom Act. And then the corollary that goes with it, I call Banking 2.0. And honestly, Banking 2.0 in the long run could be the most substantial and profound part. So tell me a little bit about some of the mechanics, like how does this change the tax code? So the tax code is tens of thousands of pages long right now. And I would estimate that under the Financial Freedom Act, it could be expressed in a couple of pages. What I was looking at is what's the right tax base, okay? So right now we tax primarily income. We tax corporate income and personal income. We tax capital gains. That's just part of our income. Sales tax, that comes from our income. Property taxes go back to income. So we're focused on taxing the stream of income and, and where we spend it. And you might say, well, what else would you tax? And so I did a study looking at what is our total income. It comes to be about $20 trillion. Sounds like a lot of money. But when our governments pre-COVID were spending 
7 trillion, you realize the problem is getting seven out of a bucket of 20. So when I say seven, that was federal spending, state spending, local spending, all governments put together in the US, it's about 7 trillion. COVID has bumped it up, but we're going with that figure as a baseline. <laughs> but if you look at the total payments that occur in our economy, that's every time money changed hands. So what would an example of that be? If when you receive your paycheck, that's a payment. When you buy something at Target, well, that's a payment. When you sell your house, that's a payment. Well, all of those payments don't come out to that much. They represent about 1% of the payments out there. So in other words, the payments that you and I are used to represent only 1% of the economy. Our income represents less than a third of 1% of the economy. So we're taxing the wrong thing. If we were to tax payments, there are over $7,244 trillion in payments. So just compare the number 20 to 7,244. And you can see we're taxing the wrong thing when we tax income. What you're really doing under a payments tax is taxing the monetary economy. That's very different than the material economy. The material economy is the live in. It's the goods and services. And that includes movies, includes our podcast. It includes everything we do in our standard of living, in our lifestyle. But the monetary economy would be uh, capitalization of a large hedge fund, sales, mortgage-backed securities, treasury bonds being traded back and forth. The entire New York Stock Exchange is about 1% of the monetary economy. So only people who are into arcane parts of financial assets really have an appreciation for the size of the monetary economy. And so if we were to tax the monetary economy or just every payment at two tenths of a percent, you would collect over three times the revenue that we collect today. And you would not have to have any personal income taxes anymore. You wouldn't need sales taxes at the stores. You wouldn't need property taxes. There's taxes at the gas tank, gas pump. You wouldn't need that. When you pay your phone bill, you look at that, maybe a third of that can be taxes, excise taxes. You rent a rental car, half the cost is taxes. Taxes impact you way more than you think. So if you were able to get rid of all of those taxes, replace them with the two-tenths of a percent payments tax, the taxes you personally pay would plummet because the synthetic monetary economy, it would be a fee on that movement of money. And that fee generates so much revenue that there's no reason for personal taxes anymore. So it's transformative. We'd be collecting about 14 and a half trillion. And right now they spend about seven, but they only collect about five. That's why we have such a big deficit. We borrow that. Then we pay interest on that borrowing. And then that grows. I mean, our national debt right now is around 30 trillion. A lot of states also have state debt. A lot of municipalities have debt. So if you'd like to look at maybe the effect on an individual, mm -hmm. let's just pick a single person earning $100,000. Today depends on where they live, but they're paying at least 30,000 in taxes. If you're in New York or California, you can be north of 40,000. That's a lot out of 100,000. With a payments tax, you pay $200. So instead of 30 to 40,000, 200, 200, that's your whole, whole tax bill. And that's all. But under the Financial Freedom Act, not only do your taxes go to $200, but you get another 24000 in basic income, free health care, free college. So in other words, you're doubling and tripling the net money that you have to work with. So in the current state of affairs now, you said we're spending $7 trillion, collecting five, with basically an ever-increasing debt that it doesn't sound like we can ever get out of. Under today's paradigm, it would be impossible. And it's so much so that you have new fields in economics that purport to show you, well, we don't need to pay it off. So modern monetary theory would argue that. Whether they're right or wrong is immaterial. I see their point. But at the same time, I think we're spending around $500 billion in interest. I mean, it's just a waste. And I would argue that it is our and the increasing debt contribute greatly to inflation. And there are a lot of technical reasons for that. And you can get smart people on either side of the argument. 
But if you look at it from an expanding money supply, that treasury bonds are every bit as much of money as currency is. So we have an extra $30 trillion of money out there being used for buying financial assets. So one of the reasons the monetary economy grows so rapidly is that's its own form of inflation. And now we fool ourselves and say, wow, Apple stock's up, the value of my house is up, I'm getting richer. But you're not really. It's it, Those assets are growing in their notional value in large measure because we've been pumping money into the economy. Look at what happens when we borrow, say, a billion dollars. The government receives a billion dollars from the sale of the treasuries, and the government spends the billion. It goes right into the pockets of whoever is vending to the government, including individuals that receive benefits. And so that money goes right back into the material economy. Meanwhile, those billion dollars of treasury bonds are liquid assets. They're just like money. There's one difference. They earn interest. So the billion turns into 1.1 billion after a while, then 1.2 billion keeps going up. So you went from 1 billion in cash into 2 billion in monetary instruments, the cash plus the treasuries, of which part of that increases with interest. So we've been doing this a very long time. That's why bread used to be 10 cents a loaf and it's $4 today. People talk about inflation again today in um, urgent tones, but the real urgency is what's happened over the decades and over the century. How much would we collect if we did as you proposed and taxed payments? Around $14.5 trillion. So double what we currently spend today. Yeah, almost triple of what we collect, and almost double of what we spend. So if it puts so much more money into our pockets, what's the, I mean, I can obviously see some of the benefits of that, right, right. for our standard of living. There, there's so much more we could do <laughs> with that. Would giving people so much more in their pockets, now, mind you, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm opposed, just asking a question, would that create a kind of inflation with putting so much back into their pockets? That's That would be the biggest concern. Yeah. Again, um, in economics, people will tend to use formulas, models, and, and they'll make passionate arguments that, yes, this will, or no, this won't. And you don't know until you try it. So what you have to look at is the root of inflation in terms of deficit spending. So we now have a balanced budget under this. So that's good. We're actually paying off the national debt. We could pay it off in about 10 years this month. That's good. The question becomes, if consumers had that much more to spend, would it be inflationary? And that question is best answered by the capacity of factories to produce. And factories don't include hard factories. It's everything we spend our money on. It would represent about a 30 or 40% gain on the GDP. And so if you were to go to General Motors and say, could you guys produce 30% more cars? They'd say, well, our, our main problem is there aren't enough people to buy the cars. So really, for most of the last couple of decades, there's been a lack of consumers. Businesses fight for the consumer. They fight for market share. That was not the case for most of man's history. That's only been the case for man's history, maybe in the last 50 years, that we can overproduce. And as long as we maintain a competitive manufacturing market and do all that we can to enhance the supply chains, we should be able to ramp up and do it. So I wouldn't say you'd want to do it overnight, but you could ramp up to it. And we could fairly quantitatively assess what that extra capacity is for production. There's a lot of talk about how our supply chain is broken today. It's a little bit of a misnomer. That obviously, COVID created problems, but our spending in this nation, consumer spending is at all-time highs. We've been bumping up spending faster than the supply chain could grow. That it doesn't take long for the supply chain to catch up though. Because the supply chain is not just U.S. factories, it's the world's capacity to produce. So who stands 
to pay the most or rather get taxed the most it, under this arrangement? It's clearly the ultra wealthy that are. They own the financial assets that are being traded. And so that was part of my research and discussions. I met with some of the legendary families that own a lot of those assets. And here's how you model that. Here's how you look at that. The value of those financial assets are linked to the activity within the monetary material economy. So in other words, when you have growth within the material economy, the monetary economy grows at a multiple. A trillion dollars of growth in the monetary economy or in the material economy will translate to maybe five to 10 or more trillion dollars of growth in financial assets. There's really no limits to how the size of the monetary economy is, which is why it's 350 times bigger than the real economy right now. It could be a thousand times bigger. It doesn't matter. It, it is a synthetic game, if you will, that can be expanded at any level you want. So those financial assets will grow faster than the growth rate within the material economy. So in the end, the ultra wealthy get ultra wealthier under a payments tax because that money is being plowed into the material economy and the multiplying effect for financial assets is far greater than the two tenths of a percent hit. So with the families I talk to, they welcome the idea and they recognize they do better too. So this concept that if this demographic does better than this demographic is going to do worse is not actually true. We design our current tax codes to reflect that and we make it true, you know, but in reality, within the real economy, it's never been true. So like if you build a house, some people build you a house, you have a house and they do better because of their wages and what they pay. Everyone does better. It's not like you get a house only because somebody else went more houseless. It's um, economy doesn't work that way. Our thinking uh, zero sum game does not reflect reality. Who would oppose this? I think there'd be a lot of people at the IRS out jobs, so maybe they wouldn't like it. Um, Maybe 30% of the big accounting firm's revenue comes from taxation. Um, I've met with executives there, and the thought of them not paying personal taxes or corporate taxes more than made up for the fact that there was going to be a, a loss of a part of their practice. I think there's some naysayers that just say nay. But again, this idea that there's going to be a substantive set of winners and losers, again, not a reflection of reality. When we developed, there were people who raised horses and created carts that lost their business, but then they gained other jobs. It's like, it's just a transition of jobs. There wasn't any factor within society that lost because of the development of the train or the development of the car or the development of the airplane. The internet came along. Now we all have email. We all do better. That's the nature of progress is that we all do better and better and better. This is a step in the right direction for progress. So literally, you can have all winners out of it. What would you need to set this up to go from where we are today to taxing payments universally, what kind of infrastructure would you need? Oh, well, that's the remarkable part. The infrastructure's in place. The, the payment system already has the capacity to shave a fee off of any payment. It's pretty minor programming to do that. Payments tax is far easier to collect than Social Security taxes or Medicare or income taxes. That's Those are horrendous to try to collect. We've developed a lot of infrastructure to do it, and you'd need almost nothing for payments taxes. Now, I think it's worth noting that we could have done this, say, 10 years ago or 20, but we couldn't have done it that much further back because the monetary economy had not expanded like it is today. And so um, 
this wouldn't have been possible always. It's only more recently possible, nor did we even have the technology or the data to understand how many payments there are. We've only been able to do that because the Federal Reserve has developed a concerted effort to do this. And they've done it in conjunction with the other central banks around the world, all coordinated through Basel, Switzerland, and the Bank for International Settlements. They created the project, the Feds became partners in to be able to keep track of this. So now we do have the data and we're able to about a year after the fact, and it's published annually in a book called The Red Book, which is available for public consumption. You simply go to the website bis.org and search for The Red Book. You'll find it. And then look up the United States and figures I'm giving you. Who would administer this? I think you would have the IRS administer it. So the IRS could also help administer basic income. So you might really be able to save a lot of the jobs there and, you know, use the existing infrastructure to make these changes. So I want to actually go back to something that you said that you mentioned something about universal income. If you don't make a certain amount, is no. there a danger that certain people could lose the incentive to earn for themselves? Yeah. Um, so the way I'd see basic income is you absolutely don't want it to stop when somebody hits a certain threshold because you built this disincentive to work. The main challenge with welfare is it disincentivizes people to work because they lose their welfare if they work. And I've done a lot of work in the field with people who are on welfare, and many of them are working and they work under the table. And they're working under the table because they don't want to lose their welfare but they're working because the welfare is not enough for them to really live off. So basic income would flip that problem on its side. You would eliminate the welfare trap that we have today, and it keeps millions out of work, and you would eliminate that problem with basic income. So everyone under this plan, the way I've written it up, no matter if they're Jeff Bezos, or a homeless guy in the side of the street would receive their $24,000 a year in basic income. You would just have to be an adult, 18, and a citizen. So when I give all these numbers about, under this plan, we'd actually have a $2.6 trillion surplus each year. And you'd be collecting two-tenths of a percent and paying basic income, healthcare, and college. You'd still have a surplus. So who else, besides the families that you've spoken with knows about this idea? So I've been having conversations with people privately on the side and developing a group of people who support this. I've been taking care to make sure they're balanced between conservatives and liberals. I think this is equally appealing to conservatives and liberals. I actually think that the whole partisan politics is really more tribalism. It's a, a form of brainwashing. It's been socialized into us to believe that there's a conservative perspective and a liberal perspective. I like to point out to people who are avid within their party that many of the issues have changed sides over the years. And it becomes very disturbing to them to know that because they think it's a part of their moral code. When in fact, a few decades back, their moral code, if they were in that party, would have viewed an issue quite differently. I'll give you an example of how things change sides. Ronald Reagan proposed one of the biggest tax cuts. We went from a 70% income to a 28% income. And John F. Kennedy was the other president that proposed the biggest tax cut. We went from around 91% income tax to 77 and then 70%. It was after his death, but he campaigned on that. And so the conservatives in 63 and 64 were up in arms about this tax cut. When with Ronald Reagan, it was a conservative cause to cut taxes. So these notions, they have nothing to do with the true conservative or liberal or progressive perspective. They're crafted and arguments are made around them. So to rile up certain constituencies, so they'll vote Democrat or Republican. There's no real truth to any of that. So in years past, when people have wanted to 
make significant change to the monetary system, including presidents, they've often been met with a, either a fatal end or a near fatal end. So there are some people who have a lot riding on it. Is this one of those dangerous ideas? No. A lot of people think it is, and a lot of people react that way when they read my book. But, you know, the people that they point to that would do me in, I've met with a lot of them already. So what can people do if they want to support you or run with this idea? I think as it comes out into the public discussion, sharing it on social media, talking about it, supporting it, I think um, when the time is right, the notion will catch fire and people will naturally support it. And there'll be a lot of discussion around it and probably a lot of misstatements about it. But I believe the, the core truth prevails. How long do you think this would take to implement? Well, it could be implemented in phases. It's not necessarily something you do wholesale. I've been asked that a lot. And we could replace Social Security taxes with a very tiny payments tax initially, see how it works, and then gradually phase it in if that's what we wanted to do. You could also start with banking 2.0 without any changes to the tax code, that could have a material effect on the economy as well. So tell me more about that. Tell me more about Banking 2.0. What does that look like compared to today? That's the part of the Financial Freedom Act I enjoy the most. It'll probably always receive less attention than a tax cut and basic income. But the other big tax in our society today is banking especially in the form of interest. So think of this for a moment. Even with low interest rates, when you buy your house, by the time you paid your mortgage, you paid twice the amount for your house. So in other words, say you buy a house for half a million dollars, you pay the builder half a million dollars, and then you pay the banker half a million. The builder built the house, he had laborers and brought material in. What did the banker do? And so my background is in I was the pioneer behind mortgage-backed securities for commercial loans. I did the very first of those pools. And it was absolutely incredible to me to think about there's alternative sources of capital other than being a bank. So I've, I've loaned out billions of dollars. And I don't have any money. There's no capital base behind that. Not one of those dollars came from me. It came through bonds that were offered that generated the money. So it's a different source of capital than a depositor at a bank. And so once we put in place commercial mortgage securitization, interest rates on commercial mortgages went from around 10% down to around five. We cut the cost of funds by doing that. Gradually, as I thought about that, you look at what would banking 2.0 be? Today, banking 1.0 is you have a bank, it needs to get depositors. It has to have its own cap from shareholders. And then you can lend some of that money out. You need a reserve. And all the regulations in banking, most of those regulations in banking, and the banks have become more and more regulated over the decades, are to protect the consumer from losing their money, the depositor from losing their money. The irony is that today, 21st century, our banks are able to do less than the Medici family did in the 14th century. They were venture capitalists, they did factoring, they did all sorts of types of financial instruments and lending that are illegal today or are relegated to non-banks. And it's just to reduce the risk. So how should a bank be structured? Banks should really simply be service agents. The Federal Reserve ought to hold the money. So in other words, let's say you go to JP Morgan and you deposit $1,000, that should go into the Fed. And JP Morgan's role is only as a service agent. They provide you the software to manage your money. And the Fed does not need your money. It disappears into a black hole. It literally disappears then. And when you want your $1,000 back, the Fed regenerates it. And now you have your $1,000 because the Fed is in the business of generating reserves. The Fed creates money and destroys money at its will. That's what any central bank does. It's nothing unusual about it. It's not this horrible fiat currency people talk about. All currencies, all money is fiat. Land is not fiat. Grain is not fiat. Gold is fiat. 
doesn't have the utilitarian value that we assign it. And so the Fed would create money to repay a depositor and it would hold the money safely. And you would never have a run on the bank because the bank's not holding your money. Oh, when the bank wants to make a loan, that's an independent action. It has nothing to do with the deposits it's turned over to the Fed. Nothing whatsoever. When I loaned out billions of dollars, it had nothing to do with deposits that I had received. I'd received no deposits. Money was generated by bonds. It could as well have been generated by the Fed. I was an originator. My job was to underwrite loans and make sure they were good. And if they were good, then the money would pass through me to the borrowers. I was just a service agent. And all banks could be that. Now, if the Fed is generating the money and you're not exposing the depositors to any loss, why shouldn't the Fed make small business loans? Why shouldn't it make venture capital decisions? Why shouldn't it be funding private equity? Banks should be able to do whatever is a, a reasonable financial tra transaction. They should be service agents. Instead, we've siloed this. We have venture capitalists, we have private equity. All of these types of entities could source their capital through the Fed. And if the Fed is just generating the money out of thin air, why would you charge interest? So you should be able to go to any bank and get a loan. The money comes from the Fed and you buy a house with it and not pay any interest. And you could cut the payment of mortgages in half. Now you would have to change the underwriting standards on getting a loan because otherwise house prices would double overnight. So that's a simple thing. Right now, when somebody qualifies you for a loan, they take a third of your income, 33%. And that's the amount you could pay for payments. But if payments are cut in half, you take 17%. That's the new qualifying factor. And now everyone can enjoy housing at half the price without the price of housing going up. That's banking 2.0. You see, the power of Banking 2.0 is it liberates you from misconceptions about money. From the United States point of view, from a nation's point of view, Banking 2.0 would put our country in the most powerful strategic position it has ever been in. Since the Fed can generate that capital and since the dollar is national currency, our large banks can become the financiers of the world at a lower cost than any other nation will have for their own capital. Currently, China is consuming Africa, buying out the natural resources, financing these nations. But we could step in and do it at a cheaper cost and in more friendly terms than they do. We could partner with countries all around the world through a banking 2.0 system. So from a strategic point of view of putting the United States in a position of real power, and doing right by other nations, Banking 2.0 is the answer. So what led you to this set of ideas? They seem so elegant in terms of how you explain them and the benefits, but how did you develop them? We studied the situation a lot. We thought of it from different perspectives. I call it the farmer, the hunter, and the handyman. Like three guys living in the woods by themselves, no money, and what did their economy look like? When would they have inflation? When would they have surplus? What does a national deficit mean to three guys in the woods? And you begin to model it that way, and then you interlay money in there, and you begin to understand economic principles in a new way. It's almost like a cartoon. I've shared that scenario and way of looking at it, which I put in my book, with some pretty good minds on Wall Street. And it was eye-opening for them, too. They're like, oh, I get why this works. Because we learn principles through reading the Wall Street Journal or economics classes. And, and they're just really philosophical theories about things. And if you want to understand how things really work, you reduce it down to these levels and extend up. So that's why I address the idea of inflation with basic income the way I do. Because if you have these three guys in the woods and there's no money involved, and let's say the farmer breaks his arm and instead of working eight hours a day, now he has to work 16 hours a day because he's slower. For every hour he puts out, he's getting half as much with the others. He's experiencing inflation. You see what I'm saying? There's two types of inflation. There's notional where your salary doubled and the price of goods means nothing. It's just notional inflation. That's more from the money supply 
except the money supply is not evenly distributed. So we do experience erosion from people who don't have as many financial assets. They fall behind the ones that do from notional inflation. But there's another more dangerous type of inflation, and it's where maybe you used to have to work six months to get a car, and now you have to work 18 months to get a car. And we are experiencing that. So my father's generation, you could save up a little while and buy a house, build a house. With my kids, that's not the case. And so in other words, you have to work longer and harder to have a house. That's the dangerous type of inflation. That comes from reductions in productive capacity and efficiency. It's like being a farmer with a broken arm. You're having longer to get the same thing. That's the dangerous type of inflation. And that comes from productive efficiency changing. And once we recognize that, you can develop governmental regulations around that to enhance efficiency, not decrease efficiency. That's the key to a better life, better standard of living for people. What's the one takeaway you want people to walk away you know, from this interview with? If we re-engineered our financial operating system, we could all live a much higher standard of living with the factories, roads, and cars that we have today. We're our own worst enemy. We hamstring ourselves with our K financial operating systems. It sounds like a no-brainer, Scott. Thank you so much for enlightening me with these concepts and for sharing them with, with my audience as well. I definitely have to have you back on because I want to learn more about some of the other principles that you've been thinking about that really underpin this. It's more than just banking, more than just changing the tax code, but there's more to this than, than meets the eye. And I really I want to have you back. So thank you so much for taking the time with me. It has been amazing to talk with you today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Mark. Hey guys, thanks for watching and listening. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.